Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Welcome to This Week, the programme the BBC invented to make Top Gear look like documentary. And you join us pondering, as we often do at this time of night, since we have nothing else to do, whether our constitutional conventions are really fit for purpose. The government thinks not after the Lords came leaping to the defence of low-paid strivers this week. Call Me Dave drove a stake through the heart of irony by tasking an unelected hereditary peer with the job of stopping such a democratic outrage from ever happening again. Critics claim uppity peers breached the so-called Sainsbury Convention. I bet most, most of them, though, shop at Waitrose. Oh, sorry, sorry, Salisbury Conventions. <laughs> Obviously named after the cathedral. The doctrine that the upper house should never stand in the way of a government measure if it was included in a manifesto, which in this case is debatable. So, we propose a new rule. Henceforth, no government shall claim a democratic mandate for any policy if, in the election campaign, it repeatedly refuses to answer any questions as to the likelihood of the implementation of said policy. In the process, reducing a seasoned political journalist who conducted numerous such fruitless interviews on that very subject <laughs> to a gibbering, seething ball of political frustration. Let's call it the Andrew Neil Convention, <laughs> just for argument's sake. It's got a nice constitutional ring to it. Speaking of getting absolutely nowhere, I'm joined on the sofa tonight by two obscure parliamentary devices <laughs> that no one understands. Think of them as the fatal motion and the fatal attraction of late night political chat. I speak, of course, of hashtag Barking Maj. See what we did there? <laughs> barking Maj. <laughs> Margaret Lady Hodge. And hashtag sad man on a train, Michael Lord of the Choo Choo, Portillo. Welcome to you both. Big moment of the week, obviously, the defeat of the government in the Lords. We're going to talk a lot about that. Sure. Other than that, what was your moment? Uh, the Saudi ambassador to the United Kingdom talked about an alarming change ah. in our relationship with Saudi Arabia. I would have thought that many people might think that there was an alarming lack of change in our relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, there have in recent years been some hundreds of um, beheadings uh, by sword in Saudi Arabia. It has a pretty dreadful human rights record. You might say that's an internal matter. Uh, but then there is the export of Wahhabism, a very um, energetically pursued export of Wahhabism, which is a very fundamental uh, part of uh, Islam. With its roots in Saudi Arabia? With its roots in Saudi Arabia, and its export has potentially volcanic effects. Certainly many of its adherents seem to be prone to being persuaded towards terrorism. So I think many people might be quite surprised that there has not been <laughs> a change of attitude towards Saudi Arabia, given its human rights record and also the sort of threat that it poses to other countries in the globe. Well, if the Saudi ambassador thinks things are bad, I hope he's gone to sleep by the time we get to a later bit in the script. Um, <laughs> Margaret, your moment. Well, I was thinking about um, the breaking of taboos in Parliament and uh, the new politics where we talk about issues we haven't talked about in the past. So we talked about tampons and sanitary towels oh, yes. on the floor of the House. And Stella Creasy managed to get Bill Cash to actually not talk about sanitary products, but to talk about uh, tampons. And the interesting thing, it reminded me of the Dawn Primarola, uh, who was a Treasury Minister when she brought in the first uh, reduction in the VAT on tampons. And she had a fantastic battle with her civil servants who said that she was bringing gender discrimination into policies around VAT. And she said, well, if you can find something that is an essential product for men, I'll look at whether we should reduce VAT on that. So they came back and said they'd found circumcision, circumcision knives as being oh. uh, subject to VAT at 20%. So I know that's a bit jokey, but the serious point is that in the new politics, we ought to have openness and real uh, willingness to talk about things that matter to ordinary people and tampons and sanitary towels do matter a lot to women nice. a lot of the time. Well, tampon is tampons are subject to VAT and male razors are not, is that right? Something like that. No, male razors are as well and there may be an argument about okay. whether okay. a razor... Okay. We're getting too much detail it, here. No, but it's around this that not, area. But actually, so men can, not news men night can night grow beards. It's just this week. Men, I know not on this programme. No, enough, enough. <laughs> That's not one moment, it's a whole book. Now, 
How many times can you <laughs> refuse to answer a question? Six, it seems, if you're the Prime Minister, and the answer involves guaranteeing nobody on tax credits will end up being worse off. But what if making people worse off now makes them better off in the long term? The government has, for obvious reasons, been somewhat reluctant to put that argument in such stark terms. But maybe the whole point is about changing people's expectations and behaviour. One fearless, some may say crazy woman, is prepared to make the case. Strap yourself in. Here's journalist Julia Hartley Brewer with her take of the week. We all need a safety net, or in my case right now, a crash mat. But why should I, like every other taxpayer, be expected to pick up the pieces of someone else's lifestyle choice? The attacks on George Osborne's plans for tax credit cuts have now reached fever pitch. But the delivery has now been pushed back after a rogue vote in the House of Lords earlier this week. But is all the rhetoric about how these cuts are a cruel, immoral attack on hard-working families really true? Every day we hear stories about families doing the right thing. They're working long hours for low pay and they're still unable to make ends meet. But behind the myth, the facts tell a rather different story. The truth is that many of the people who rely on tax credits aren't poor because they earn low wages, but because of the choices that they themselves have made. A choice to work part-time, or in some cases not at all, or a choice to have more children than they can afford. For seven out of ten couples claiming working tax credit, only one adult is working, whether they've got kids or not. And in a third of households, no one is working full-time at all. Is it really any wonder that couples who work just a few days a week between them can't afford to make ends meet? Could you? Meanwhile, 84,000 families claiming tax credits have five or more children. Could you afford to raise five kids on your wage? <coughs> yes, of course, there are plenty of deserving families who genuinely do need tax credits. But there are far too many who simply expect everyone else to pick up the bill for their lifestyle choices. Credits were supposed to get people back into work. Instead, they've become an alternative to getting a job. They were supposed to be a safety net, not a tangled web. A hand up, not a handout. Thanks. The Chancellor should go ahead with the cuts, but judging by the current debate, the only thing likely to fall anytime soon is me. <laughs> from oxygen-free jumping in Acton, where else, to our own little compression chamber. Julia Hartley Brewer joins us now. Welcome. Michael, do you agree that many of the people who rely on tax credit credits are only poor because they've made decisions to work part-time or they've had too many kids that they can't afford? I don't think I know enough about it to make that judgment. But, of course, one of the, one of the decisions that people clearly make is how many children they're going to have. And one of the reasons that tax credits exist is that employers pay wages according to what they think the labour is worth, not according to how many children they think their employee has got. And the state does undoubtedly step in to make up the difference between what the employee thinks the labour is worth and the costs of the number of the children that the person may have. You're shaking your head. I am shaking my head because I think people have forgotten why we brought in tax credits. Now, I think it's hugely cumbersome. It's very expensive. It's open to fraud and abuse, you know, fraud and error. But we brought it on for two reasons. One was that we wanted to make work pay, and the other was that we wanted to always target on those that needed it most. And you can't do that through raising personal allowances. Now, I think because everybody you're... benefits. Because everybody that. benefits. So I think, Julia, where you're wrong in your film is that there are people who are working 16 hours or so a week, you know. But actually, if you take away the tax credit, then 
it no longer is worth their while working. So it's getting them into work, it's getting them into the habit of working. And then as their kids grow up, they may, they may go full time. And okay. if you look at some of the, just one final point, if I can. Yeah, I want you to come back on that. Why don't you, just the point okay. you made, what, what, what do you say? No, but the trouble is, I, mean, I understand that incentive, but the trouble is it also provides a disincentive after 16 hours or 24 hours for a couple, where actually, if you do work any extra time, your marginal rate of tax is so high. What's the point of going out to work for those extra hours when you can get the money for free from the taxpayer? It's not worth the while for the person in that situation, but it is worth the while for the taxpayer who's paying it otherwise. But Julia, I can mount exactly the same argument with you and say that if you take it, if you take it away, what will happen, and this is a couple of the think tanks have come out with these figures this week, mm -hmm. your marginal rate of taxation for mm -hmm. going in and doing 10 hours worth a week up. goes up. Yeah. It's 93%. No, of course. So every single parent... Up, so doesn't it make it worse? That's, I, I look, I think there's problems with the changes as, as they were done. I don't think it's beyond the wit of man or even the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, to come up with a way of making changes. But you have to have a situation where uh, it, there is an incentive for both couples, to, uh, both people to work. It's understandable for single parents that they may need to work part-time when their children are very young, although not part-time throughout their, child, their child's childhood because most parents do actually work full-time. Seven out of ten claimants of work Working tax credit have only one adult in work because the second adult is viewed like the child as a dependent. And that's an extraordinary figure. We're told constantly that, that, that people claiming working tax credits and child tax credits are the hard working poor, and undoubtedly, undoubtedly, many are. But also, there are an awful lot who aren't hard working poor. They are, they are, they are poor okay. because they don't do enough hours. Margaret? Uh, well, Julia, seven out of ten mm. of the people who benefit from tax credit are actually women. Mm. So they've also got their childcare responsibilities. That's the point at which they're poorest and they require the... But is it... We now spend 30 billion a year on this. Is that too much? Is it, or is that right? I mean, it's a redistribution. Maybe that's something that should be welcomed. Or is it too much? Well, I think it is It is a very... It's a very cumbersome tax. Mm. It is a ta it, uh, credit. It's a, it's a, it is open to huge error and huge fraud. I would like us to get round the table. Really, it's one of those issues where you've got to get round the table. We all want work to pay, make work pay. Get round the table and sort it out. I don't think it's as easy as you say you think it is. You know, the Chancellor can sort it out. I don't think, I don't think that's the case. I, I mean, it slightly reminds me of the debate in the 60s and 70s where the Tories felt that they could not reverse the Labour ratchet. You know, Labour had, done, had, had created a welfare state but also nationalised industries and so on, and there seemed to be no way of working back. Now, you know, Gordon Brown set a bar of the welfare state extremely high. He has set a high water mark. And it seems that the argument is that wherever the previous Labour government has set the high water mark, the Tory government is not allowed to reduce the water level well, in the next period of government. Well, they've taken away a lot of tax credits from the better yeah, off because it was going have. right up the income scale. Yeah. That bit has We're changed. up to £50,000. But, pounds but, up, but, no, but as you but, say, £30 billion. But, but, but it's still £30 but, bi billion. But here's the issue. Getting from A, even if B is the right yeah. direction, yeah. Yeah. getting from A to B is a problem. And under the existing plans, low-paid workers are going to lose a lot of money mm -hmm. may not seem so much to people on big salaries, but if you're only on yep. 15,000 a year or 12,000 a year and you lose 12, 1,500, mm. yep. that's a lot of money. But you can incentivize people by not making the second uh, adult, usually the woman, often even when they have no children as a, as a dependent and, and basically have them entitled to working tax credits in their own right, which will also incentivize them to work. Uh, I know people who work in job centers who have told me quite specifically that it is quite routine that people on tax credits will come in and say I work 16 hours a week or, or 24 hours a week I've been offered uh, a full-time job or lots of extra hours by my employer is it worth my while doing it when they point out to them that actually for them it isn't worth their while they won't be have a single extra penny in return for working yeah. those extra hours well, they turn the work down now that is an insane state right. of affairs. But let, me, let me just say Andrew <laughs> you, no, no, you, you, you've been talking about the proposals of course the proposals are now dead mm -hmm. we're gonna get something else yeah. in the autumn state are, so. are we just gonna get a tweak well, I think we'll get quite a big tweak. But the point I wanted to make was, it seemed to me, you know, it seemed at first very clever that the Labour and Liberal Democrat peers had got together and voted down the order and therefore made a bit of a monkey of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. In fact, it would have been much cleverer to let the order go through. Because at the moment, all the argument is about people making theoretical losses. Nobody's made any loss at all yet. It may be that the Chancellor will make changes that will either mean that no one will make a loss or that many fewer people will make a loss or that people will make less of a loss. 
What would have been clever of the opposition peers would have been to saddle the Chancellor of the Exchequer with his original proposal, because I do believe that it would have become very uncomfortable politically if, in fact, three million mm. people had lost a thousand pounds a year. Has Brand Osborne been hurt by this? Oh, undoubtedly. We're, we're back with the pasty tax and the caravan tax, aren't we? Yeah. He's, he's not seeming yeah. so sure-footed as he has. He's often been seen, isn't he, as a great political operator, not just... People as, keep uh, on as saying as well. that, but we remember the 2012 Omni Shambles, and now we've got this? We have, and yeah, I do think that an awful lot of the outcry about this, well, it, partly it's down to the fact there are over three million people affected, and that's three million voters, but also the fact that I think that most people who debate this don't understand that so many of the people who claim working tax credit and child tax credits are not what most people consider to be the hard-working poor. The people who are paying for those tax credits, the 30, million, 30 billion quid, they're the hard-working people. They're the people who mum and dad, with young children or without, who go out to work and, and work full-time to pay taxes. Hang on a minute, Julie. That's hang, the reality. Hang on. I mean, there are two things. First of all, the three million, the, the reason the Chancellor should be worried, and I actually agree with Michael, I think politically it would have been terrible for the families, but politically it might have been more... It's more sensible to let that pain be there because it's a lot. A lot of them are in conservative marginal seats. So you know, if Labour gets its act together, we might we might win them back. But um, let, let's these aren't even if you get the tax credit. I mean, mm. ten, I have ten thousand families in my my constituency who will be affected by the changes in the tax credit. And you could have done it in a more sensible way. You could have just said new applicants. Well, you, right? I'm not in charge. Well, we <laughs> he no, could have done but it. You but, said but, it doesn't it, involve it, hardworking. It, it, yeah, but but just to finish up on this point, I mean, it does involve some hardworking families yeah, of because it does. because those yeah, who no absolutely. Julia said that they involve some, but no, but you were saying most of the hardworking were the ones paying the thirty billion. No, but I'm just saying that a lot of the people who are very upset about this these tax credit change are not are not actually aware of the fact that a lot of the people we are referring to with the, this little phrase hardworking families are between them as a couple working three days a week out of ten. If most families paying the taxes to cover these tax credits are working ten days a week between them, two people five days. A week each, and they are they are paying taxes to fund a supposedly hardworking people who are working three out of ten days. They might feel that what the solution should be is that those people work longer hours. You talk about the pain. The reality is, for a lot of these people, they will actually go out and get more well, work. Well, they need time Five. to be able to. Do, they need time to be able to do that. And there's an assumption on the A that most people on working tax credit are like that. They're not. They're a minority, and they'd be very. I know from my own Seven out of ten. All right. Maybe people, One out of okay. ten doesn't no, work at all. We're going to leave it there. Really We're reasons. a bit going round in circles now. We'll have plenty of time <laughs> to do that between now and the autumn statement. And we'll hear what he's done, Julia. Thanks for being with us. I've been getting away with it all